as the world changes, I think we all have to change the way we look at what we do and, and um, be much more flexible. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking with James Pickard, who co-founded Cartwright Pickard Architects along with Peter Cartwright in 1997. And he's been running the London office ever since, working on a number of award-winning and pioneering projects. So James has market-leading skills in housing design with a particular strength in developing buildable, viable schemes for challenging and complex urban sites and he has helped the practice to develop a reputation for innovation and the practical use of off-site construction methods with a particular focus on lean low carbon solutions air quality and well-being james was on the main board of constructing excellence from 2005 to 2007 and has been an assessor for several industry award schemes including having been a jury member on the world architecture festival awards for several years he was made an honorary professor at the glasgow school of art for his contributions to the mcintosh school of architecture he is also the founder of tessellate.co a disruptor platform in the recruitment space which seeks to solve many of the problems that architectural businesses face when recruiting and these problems include high recruiter fees, the enormous amount of wasted time spent on hiring and ending up receiving a very poor match. The platform seeks to empower both candidate and employer and provides a fair and bias-free process to candidate selection. So in this episode, James discusses the problems that the architecture industry faces with hiring and recruitment, how Tessellate.co was born out of these frustrations and seeks to solve them, and advice for practices for staff attraction and retention. So sit back, relax, and enjoy James Picard. One of the most difficult parts about running your architecture practice is making sure you're getting the right fee for the job. We hear small architecture firm owners ask all the time, how do I know what my competitors are charging? How do I know if I'm charging the right fees? Guestimating fees can be very risky. If you undercharge, you get to the end of the fee and there's still more job left to do. Then you find yourself either robbing Peter to pay Paul or stealing from a more profitable project to support a less profitable project. On the flip side, you probably don't want to charge your clients more than you actually need in order to get the project done. The industry has been lacking this resource for too long. We constantly hear firm owners talk about how great it would be to have some sort of guide or comparison about what architecture firms actually charge. Is my pricing right? How do I know if it's right? They go to Google, but end up with outdated or inaccurate information, or what they find doesn't quite seem to fit the flow of their firm's specific approach or demographics. So we've decided to fix this problem ourselves and create this long overdue resource for you. Ever since we founded Business of Architecture over 10 years ago, this has been one of the most common questions we get. So we are really excited about this. By December of this year, we will be launching the first stage of a comprehensive architecture fee report that will reveal what architecture practices around the world are actually charging and how they set their fees. You'll get to see if others are charging a percentage of construction cost, a stipulated sum, or an hourly rate. Along with the associated amounts based on the type of project, their geographical location, and other demographics. Now, one of the advantages of us taking this on as a consulting agency is we can actually put out this kind of information. A couple of decades ago, some may remember that the AIA got into big trouble because they published something similar. The United States Justice Department decided that this was considered price fixing, causing a monopoly, and they shut it down. But since Business of Architecture is not a membership organization and not representing architecture as a whole, we are not limited in discussing fees. Because it is our mission to help architectural practices succeed, we are very excited about gathering and providing this information to all of you in the industry. Keep an eye out in your inbox for more details coming soon. If you're not already on our email list, head over to thebusinessofarchitecture.com, sign up for our free live video training, and watch for your inbox for more details from there. Those on our mailing list will be the first to get notified when we release the architecture fee report. So if you're a small architecture practice owner 
you are finally going to get to see very clearly what other similar sized firms with similar demographics and similar project types are actually charging and how they are setting their fees. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. James, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very well indeed. Good to have you back. And we had a we had a slight technical problem with the last podcast that we did a few uh, a couple of months ago now. And we had a, a very delightful conversation, and unfortunately, we lost it to the digital overlords that were not on our side that day. So I'm very excited to have you back, um, and that you've been gracious enough to um, you know come come back and 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 discuss what we were talking about last time. So you're the one of the founding partners of Cartwright Picard Architects. Um, You've, you've got an, an enormous experience of being a practicing architect, running a successful firm here in the UK. Um, there's two offices, is that right? Three, yeah. So we've Three been offices. in business for we're in our, um, 25th year, we had our 25th anniversary um, this year. So um, we have, uh, I run the London office and we have offices in um, Leeds and Manchester as well. Mm-hmm. Fantastic. And you've also the founder of Tessellate.co, yes. which is yeah. a really interesting new platform or disruptive platform to encourage or to, to, to facilitate powerful recruitment for architecture businesses. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was really founded um, to offer an alternative, much more affordable, and we mm-hmm. think potentially more um, user-friendly alternative to the default, which is usually advertising or um, using recruiters. And um, over the years, we found that there are significant downsides to both advertising and recruiters. <clears throat> With mm-hmm. advertising, um, we often get 50 to 100, sometimes 200 CVs for an advert. And what we find is, is that 90% of those CVs are completely off the mark the, the the candidate has not read the advert probably they've just sent off their cv mm-hmm. but our hr staff feel obliged to go through everyone give them equal you know reading time etc and they they um end up with cv blindness really you just get fed up of going through uh, you know all these cvs um one after the other many of which are just not appropriate and it and it you start to lose lose sight of the wood for the trees and that's the problem yeah so um that's one issue and then the other one obviously is with recruiters um who we're not suggesting will disappear altogether there'll always be a need in some shape or other i'm sure for that personal service you might get feel you get Mm -hmm. but um, they come at a high price so typically it's at least 15 but usually 20 percent in the us for example i'm being told it's more like 30 percent um of, of that of the annual salary and it's not just the total cost, it's this sort of what we regard as, as very unfair terms in mm-hmm. architecture, which we don't believe applies in most other sectors, but certainly in architecture, in the built environment, most recruiters um, state in their contracts that after there's a sliding scale, if, if the person leaves within the first eight weeks, you get a vanishing amount of your money back. After eight right. weeks, you get nothing back. And we right. all know in the business the reason why we have a six month probationary period in, everyone, in everyone's contract is it takes six months to find out if somebody really is what they say they are, can do the mm-hmm. job. So why on earth don't recruiters tie into that six month probationary period? Now we understand in other sectors, that's exactly what happens and you get 50% of your money back if the candidate leaves for any reason in that first six mm-hmm. months. So those are the sorts of things, unfair terms and when we researched the, the market, we found that um, candidates and uh, employers alike felt very frustrated with the kind of service that they were getting, particularly from recruiters. Um, candidates often felt bullied into going to 
uh, interviews in offices they weren't really interested in, but because recruiters are often quite small organizations with very limited pools of employers, limited jobs in other words, they tend to shunt people into these jobs, whether they're right or wrong for them. Um, so uh, when we did our um, market research, we found that, that, that there was quite a lot of unhappiness amongst candidates actually in the way they were treated really just as a number. Mm -hmm. And um, even to the case where some some candidates had had their CVs sent to their current employer by mistake, which was very embarrassing. Um, and then the flip side of that is the employers, you know, you're paying a lot of money um, for the service you get. And obviously there, are, mm -hmm. there will always be notable exceptions to every rule, but our own experience has been pretty shabby the way we've been treated by some recruiters with them. Um, uh, fairly sort of aggressive tactics and um, just, you know, and then the worst thing, the, the icing on the cake, the cherry on top is when you've employed someone through a recruit and you find that the, the same recruiter has come and headhunted them back from you a year later. Mm -hmm. And that is a very common, common practice. And I just, you know, verging on an unethical in a way. Yeah. And I think um, those are the sorts of things that we feel are unacceptable, the unacceptable face of, of recruiters. Mm -hmm. And so we, we felt that there needed to be an alternative, which, um, and, and Tessellate is, is really primarily aimed, it's a bit like, in a sense, a very uh, sophisticated um, dating app in a way. It, it basically takes, in 15 minutes, a candidate can, can complete their uh, information about themselves, um, setting out their skills and experience, and the same for the employer, and then the algorithm will automatically start matching uh, the, the employer's um, jobs with, with the candidates on the, on the, on the um, web app, on, on the platform. Um, and the, the early stages, the, 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 the matching stage is, is blind. So um, the employers never see the name at uh, the start. They don't see the name, the age, the ethnicity, or the gender of the candidate. So we, what we like about that is it takes out any opportunity for um, unconscious bias, which we know is a mm -hmm. really big problem in recruitment. You know, white, pale, male, stale, middle-class men tend to um, select people like themselves from a similar mm -hmm. educational backgrounds. And, you know, the architecture is dominated by white middle-class men running architectural practices in senior positions. And unfortunately, the level of diversity in architecture is is nowhere near what it should be, and mm -hmm. I do feel there's a sort of self perpetuating um, thing going on with 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 a lot of unconscious bias, which I believe happens all you know in, in all sorts sure. of different careers. But we thought also Tesla's a great way at the early stages of completely getting rid of any opportunity for that. So once you are matched, um, it also the the the, um, the platform puts all of the control into the hands of the candidate, so they're not pushed around. The candidate stays um, anonymous through all the early stages, and the candidate is notified that they've got some matches within employers or employers. And um, if those employers want to follow that up, the employer sends a message via the platform to that candidate: "Oh, we'd like to get mm -hmm. to know more about you. Can we download your information? Can we?" And, and the, it, the control is with a candidate. The candidate can then see what, the name of the practice, the size of the practice, where it is, the type of work it does. And, and the candidate can retain complete anonymity and go, do you know what? No, I, that, they're too commercial. They're a very big practice. So I don't really want to work in London or I'd rather work here. And so they just swipe left or whatever. You know, just, just don't follow that one up. And then when, when a match pops up from a practice you are interested, you can go the other way and say, yeah, I would like to. And so press a button and you send your detail CV and, and your portfolio, which again can still have your personal information redacted from it to an extent. So you're still retaining anonymity up to another level. And then if the employee thinks, yes, now this is looking really good, I'd like to get more, you then get an invitation to an interview and then you can reveal a lot more about yourself, but you've got yourself to that interview stage. Mm -hmm. um, and we just and feel then, that, that's uh, a you know, good way of doing it. At, at, at that point, when it goes into the interview stage, then that's the kind of top of the, the business's hiring funnel, if you like, where yeah, then the candidate exactly. would go through whatever yeah. 
hoops and hurdles yeah. that the employer yeah. is, is putting them through. Yeah, and I think you'd like to think that by the time you get to an interview stage, the employer's taking it pretty seriously. Yeah. And um, all of those opportunities for unconscious bias that we know happen when people mm -hmm. not, you know, they don't notice they're doing it, but people, it's, it's, it's well known, people tend to select people from similar backgrounds to themselves without realising yeah. it. And, and we think that's a great way of helping to try and um, get a better um, ethnic and gender balance into into architecture and design generally. Um, do you, do, from, from the architect's perspective then, from the employer's perspective, they're now being chosen, if you like. Um, and does this mean that there's a kind of certain way that they need to make sure that they're communicating or there are some sorts of tips that they can do to make sure that they're presenting their best self, if you like? Well, on what tesselate.co has on the platform also is is what we call the grid which is an information kind of point on 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 the platform where you where um, employers mem who are members of tesselate it costs costs the employers nothing to actually join and it costs them nothing to put as many jobs on the platform as they like they only pay an 8% fee when a placement is actually made so we're right. looking it's at a very, it's a very reasonable one compared it's to the it's a really low fee compared to recruiters and also it's um you get a free replacement candidate if the the individual leaves for any reason within the first six months so we're trying to be as as transparent as fair as possible but employers have the opportunity on the grid we call it to put hmm. information about themselves any research projects they've done any in really interesting um projects they've completed so there's an opportunity for them to put their best foot forward and obviously, candidates will always look at their websites once they realize, oh, that's the firm that I've got a match with. Yeah. Um, now, I'd, I'll be I'll be honest with you. We've we we launched just before lockdown and, mm -hmm. and, and COVID lockdown, and we obviously no one was recruiting. Lots of people being furloughed and made redundant, so the, there was no um, recruitment going on for quite a while. So we kind of uh, mothballed it essentially, and and um, just in, invested in trying to improve the app from comments that we've been receiving. And we've fairly recently relaunched. Um, nothing's perfect. So there are still the odd glitch here and there. And if we get a user that says, oh, this isn't happening, we, you know, we've got our software developer who will investigate it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, slowly but surely, we're hoping to get the, the, um, the way the algorithm works and the platform works generally to just constantly improve based on feedback that we're getting. I think we've got so, around 150 candidates on the platform now, which is really, really quite exciting. Fantastic. First of all, is there anybody involved then once the candidate has put their information on? Is there anybody kind of manually looking at something and making sure that the fit's right? Or is it completely? Yeah, we have an operation. Um, we have an operation, um, marketing operations manager who hmm. looks, if you like, at the back end of the way the platform's working and can actually see all the activity can see all the jobs that the employees are putting on can see all the candidates and we can see the, the stages they've gone through i mean we can see actually there are hundreds of potential candidates who've got halfway through but then for whatever reason just not finished not completed mm -hmm. um, we can see when a match is made but a candidate chooses not to follow through um, it's a surprising you know people behave in all sorts of different ways for different reasons um, so yes we can monitor all of that and if we have um, uh, uh, you know, the opportunity on the platform for people to um, ask any questions, both employers and candidates can um, you know, email us or with a bot, just send us, you know, uh, there's a kind of opportunity for a chat box, if you like, with, with, with um, our staff, our team, so we can give feedback and advice. Um, that that is all possible. What we don't want to do is have a telephone answering line, if you like. We don't want to right. have a kind of go go to that point. But it doesn't mean that our operations um, manager can't speak to people. Of course, she could if we needed to, and they, that could be arranged. Mm. But initially, it's um, it's through the sort of chat chat line. Um, so how did how did the idea come about of of it kind of being a, a platform? Um, or well, how, how did guess, you how did you brainstorm this? Come it come up with it as an idea. Well, I think there's as this, there's nothing new under the sun. Let's 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 admit that. So, yeah, um, I think there are 
similar forms of platform in other sectors. Um, and although they didn't all exist when we dreamt this up sort of three years mm -hmm. ago, but um, there were a few. Now, uh, it, it, some seem to be more successful in other sectors, in, in some other sectors for different reasons. But we just felt that um, with you know the way that particularly younger people uh, work nowadays and using mobile technology and smartphones, you know, you can put all your information onto tessellate.co on your smartphone. You can monitor all your matches on your smartphone on the bus or on the tube on the on the way home, whatever, you know. So it can it can have a minimal impact on your life. You don't have to get all of these painful phone calls and emails from a recruiter hassling you. You don't have to trawl the internet looking for architects that are advertising and you don't have to send off thousands of cvs hoping to get the call and mm -hmm. then not getting the call because you know you're not necessarily getting the responses um and the time and that can take a long time so we've, we're trying to take out the hassle for everybody um mm -hmm. taking out the hassle for the hr people in architects practices and often in the smaller practices that can be a partner or a director who has to go through all the CVs. And, you know, if you have to go through 100 CVs for one job, it can be a bit mind numbing. So to yeah. have it filtered by a smart, intelligent um, algorithm, which is doing the sort of initial filtering, matching the experience and skills, that's really what it's doing. So you're always being mm -hmm. judged on your experience and skills, not, you know, who you are, where you're educated, whether you're male or female or any other reason, you know, or your age, which mm -hmm. unfortunately we know, you know, does influence decision making yeah. otherwise. So, so did, did the Tesla.co, did it begin life as an as an in-house hiring platform for Cartwright Picard or, no, or was it always no, envisioned as a as a sort of a no, service for the no, industry? As a whole? I mean we don't, you know, we don't recruit that many people to warrant um developing the software for this. So Right. It came out of um, our own personal experience, I guess, with with recruiters who we felt we were treated very shabbily by one particular firm who can remain nameless. And yep. I just I was in the pub discussing it with the managing director of another firm of architects. And he said, God, we've had the same experience. It's awful. And had the same experience. I sat on the board of, you know, the Wren insurance company that insures sort of the 60 large 60 of the largest firms of architects in Britain. I was on the board for a few years. That's a mutual. And um, the REN was set up over 30 years ago to provide professional indemnity insurance for architects yeah. as, a, as a complete alternative, a challenger to a disruptor to the current market for um, professional indemnity insurance for architects 30 years ago because the market was dysfunctional and architects felt they were being ripped off. So um, half a dozen architects founded the Wren, and I and I have to say that my involvement in the Wren on the board made me think. You know, look, here's a, six firms of architects did this. It's now a really big organisation with with a lot of resources. It's a it's a fantastic thing, and it and it's it were all the profits you know roll back into the organisation, make it better and better, and it's looking after the interests of the, the profession. And I just felt that. When you look at the amount of money, particularly some of the larger firms were spending on recruiters, I mean, t hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands of pounds in some cases is what we found out. You know, wouldn't it be better if that money was just put into salaries of architects, for example? You know, yeah, you, could absolutely. Be, you could put two or three thousand pounds onto the salary of every architect employed in, in that particular firm instead of spending 150,000 yeah. on recruiters' fees that year. Um, so trying to keep the money within the profession and not, you know, letting it squirt out all these expensive um, people outside who are just, you know, slicing away. You, you know, you're 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 in you're very close to under, You know about the business of architecture. And you know where how architects mm -hmm. can um, can you know basically lose their profitability. Yeah, um, very quickly. And and the other the other thing is salaries in architecture are an all time low in real terms. Mm -hmm. So you know, I mean. I, I don't know the exact number, but I believe the average salary of an architect in Britain is roughly 45K a year. And I think it was around 45K a year 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think just the Architects Journal's own surveys show that if you applied inflation over that period, 
we're all about 25% worse off than we were 10 years ago, which is pretty shocking, really, given, you know, you, architects spend seven and a half years studying, some even more than that, you know, before they qualify as an architect. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's a high risk, uh, sadly, very low reward profession at the moment. Yeah. Um, and I just felt, felt that, um, you know, anything you can do to improve the efficiency of the way architects work and turn off these taps of money that are going bleeding, bleeding, bleeding the, the, the business dry. Why, why, you know, why wouldn't you try something like that? Mm -hmm. um, so go on, go on. How, how, how was the, the, the platform then de developed? Was it developed as, a, as an investment from Cartwright Picard? And then you guys put your own money into it to, to get up and running or we did put did our you... own money into it. But what I, yeah. at the start, I said to myself, listen, I'm not, I'm only going to do this if, if, if there's really a, a good sentiment from a number of architectural practices that this is a good idea. So we actually crowdfunded it with probably around 12, 12 people. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, most of whom are architects or engineers and, uh, who all felt passionately. Yes. I'll put my money into this because, you know, if this takes off, wow, what a great thing to do. Um, we set it up through what's called an EIS um, with the HMRC, which basically means that um, everybody that invested their own money got 40% uh, of that back in tax relief as mm -hmm. soon as they did it. And then if Tesla ever went bust, they, they can then reclaim their investment. So the maximum they would lose is, I believe, 38p in the pound. So it's actually quite low risk because, you know, the, a lot of the risk is taken away. Um, Got it. So this is one of these, the enterprise scheme, that's it. schemes. Yeah. 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 And then, and then the other big kick upside for the investors is if Tesla does well um, in the long run, if it is ever sold on to, to a bigger firm to invest more into it, then mm -hmm. um, any capital gains they make is, is hundred percent tax free. So the government set up the, um, EIS scheme intentionally to encourage um, this sort of investment in startups because we know that that startups are the future. You know, yeah. um, Tesla was a startup once upon a time, um, as was SpaceX. You know, you just see you see these firms that have gone stratospheric, excuse the pun, and um, <laughs> they all start as startups from somewhere. Um, yeah, technology startups, and the US is brilliant at, at, at supporting technology mm -hmm. startup so it's Got I guess, it. so, that idea so it's it so it's in an investment wrapper basically that kind well, of for those for those people that, in, that for those individuals that put their own earnings Capital into in. it what the earnings they yeah. paid tax on but cartwright pickard right. architect itself has also invested um and i've personally invested so you mm -hmm. know it's um yeah it's it's a crowdfunded um platform essentially can you tell us a little bit about the about the process that you went through then from having the idea and then you know who did who were the first people that you that you get involved how do you take an, an idea how do, how do you begin to create a disruptive ai solution to something like this um well i think market research is is your number one thing you, you have a hunch that this would go down well and would be needed so then we did mm -hmm. quite a lot of market research talking to potential candidates um, right. we've got groups in a room and discussed it all found out what the woes were what the, the nasty stories were from using for example recruiters and then the hassle of sending cvs off answering adverts and things and so we found that there was you know the the, the process for candidates was was equally unsatisfactory mm -hmm. and then um we also talked to the practices a lot of the the investors are senior architects in firms within practices in, in the UK. And um, so the idea, the functionality behind the Tesla.co platform was reviewed and discussed with, um, with those investors and some of whom are directors, by the way. And so they've right. been involved in, in guiding the way that the platform has been developed. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, it's, it, 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 it follows what we believe that the market should need. I think the key issue for Tesla.co now is that we don't really have um, brand recognition yet in the industry. Mm -hmm. And um, 
we we probably need to invest uh, more in um, getting the brand known. And so we're going to be we're sponsoring um, various awards and things coming up. So we, we hopefully get our name out there. Um, one of the other things we'd be doing in terms of social value is we've said that for every placement that is made, we will put £200 into a fund, build that fund up, and then we'll probably channel that perhaps through the RIBA or, or other charities um, that specialise in and focus on um, uh, supporting students from... Mm -hmm. um, less less well-off backgrounds and from ethnic minorities um, there are various organizations that specialize in that and so we're, we're talking to them um, hopefully if we build up a, a pot of cash um, yeah then then we'll be giving back if you like to again to try and help diversity because there's also an issue of of sort of um as i've mentioned earlier our architecture is a very middle class profession mm -hmm. um people from uh, poorer working class backgrounds just don't feel architecture is the right, you know, is, is a profession they should enter, um, which is a great shame because we don't have enough diversity of the way people think. And, um, and that, again, is something that I would love to change. But, I mean, it's interesting, the, the conversation about diversity and also the conversation around architects salaries and and fees and there's there's often a, a kind of a link there if you like um between the return on the investment of education and then perhaps when architects or younger students there was an there was an article in the in the aj the other day about you know why are students not deciding to become architects mm. um and particularly from ethnic minority groups that's the the kind of lowest attrition rate if you like well the, the, the lowest rate of um of people actually continuing all the way way through and and certainly when i've interviewed the leaders in those groups the the architect's fees or the architect's salary is often a big it's a big it's a it's a big issue in this when we're going to be spending seven years you're going to be spending right. x x amount of money on investment well then why would i become why would i become an architect well there's a there's a there's a really big problem in our profession it's the elephant in the room unfortunately that no one talks mm -hmm. about but i'll give you a, a short story to explain that and very recently we've we've lost out we we've lost out uh, on a project where we won a competition originally but the contractors gone and got a quote from another architect who came in massively below our fee which was an absolutely competitive reasonable fee We've since found out, I've just interviewed an architect for a job and since found out that that practice, who can remain nameless, um, had this lad working a 60-hour week. Mm. Um, you know, most of that, uh, and the overtime's all unpaid. And he even said that most of the staff work an 80-hour week, all unpaid. Now, you can see why some of these firms basically survive off uh, sw the sweatshop atmosphere of making their young architects work very long hours unpaid and that's where they make their profits and they go in with insanely low fees we're shocked sometimes it's a really saddening and disheartening that there are architects that run businesses that go in it with ultra low fees to put bums on the seats now whether these people have got other forms of income as well maybe they're married to a banker or a lawyer who earns a lot of money and it's this is their plaything. you know having an architecture business is 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 you know a sort of nice thing to talk about at dinner parties to your friends oh i'm an architect you know, but that the, there must be a lot of architects out there who don't do it for a living who do it as a vocation the sad mm -hmm. bit is is that the people that pay the price are the young young architects and trainees and who are being paid derisively low salaries and or, mm -hmm. or paid a salary but being expected to a very long unpaid uh, chunks of overtime all the time which is completely unacceptable yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it's it, it's really disheartening that architects themselves are their own worst enemy. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why our salaries are so low and um, that, you know, we, we, we really are. It, 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 I mean, it, how, how low can it go? You know, I think I think your average architects earn less than a, a London underground train driver, etc. Well, et this I'm, goes on. I'm, I was doing a bit of research the other day and I was comparing and the average architect of, I think it was, yeah, five years or so, 45K 
or and comparing that to not to um bad mouth a mcdonald's manager yeah but mcdonald's a manager of a mcdonald's in in london is between you know average is about 35 to forty seven thousand yeah pounds and it's like well you know a manager of mcdonald's yeah. you can you yeah. can get to that stage mm-hmm. financially in a lot less time than you can get to being and you know it takes to become an architect and you don't have the sort of same level of legal responsibilities and you know things that can can come back at you if you like and it starts to really you know ask these questions of well, what's going what's going on here in the industry and you know, and you're quite right these stories of practices that are just lowballing lowballing mm-hmm. other practices um and having exploitative employment regimes if you like t- in order to be able to keep the practice moving like that it's totally totally unacceptable totally totally it's unacceptable. very disheartening it really is um how 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 and I'm, I'm quite interested in how tessellate will be able to kind of will protect candidates from that kind of thing i'm imagining obviously you have a high screening process for the for the practices if they want to be on the if they want to be well, part I of think, the platform I think our starting point was try and cut out waste and try right. and, and save practices spending 20 percent of the salary when they recruit and as i said some of the larger firms mm. in london um uh and some of the partners of those firms or directors were part of the crowd original crowdfunding investors were spending between 100 and 200,000 a year on recruiters fees now that that money could could all have gone to the employees the staff if um if or most of it a lot more of it could have done if they'd used other means yeah. um so um and you know to be honest you know if you're a very large firm you probably don't need quite as many hr staff either if you use tesla because if you if you advertise, as I say, you do get hundreds and hundreds of CVs, and you, so you need a lot of people reading those CVs. But if you're not getting hundreds of CVs, and you let the the algorithm do your matching, then mm-hmm. um, you don't need all those people getting you know CV blindness reading and tr- trudging through yeah. them. You can have a leaner a leaner HR um, activity, basically. What what so do you savings? I would say. Got it. What, what would you hope to see Tessellate do to the industry in terms of like how many practices would you like to, is there a, is there a kind of set of t- a targets in terms of how many practices you want to be using the, the platform or? I mean, we'd love to have as many practices as possible join as members. And, and as I say, putting, putting, they can put as many jobs on the platform free of charge as they wish. You only pay when mm-hmm. an actual match is done, is made. Um, and not and, and obviously firms are not always recruiting, but we one of the other the, the benefits of Tesla.co is that we've got some key suppliers who are offering Tesla members. So any architect, it's a sort of no-brainer really. If you join as a member, which is free of charge, um, we've got I think three or four firms of lawyers that have um, employment uh, specialised in employment law will give you. Um, 20% discount on their normal rates for things like, you know, employment contracts, advice, if you've got any uh, advice that you need for whatever, whether that's disciplinary or mm-hmm. let's say you need, you know, working from home contracts, drawing up or Brexit issues, whatever it might be, you mm-hmm. can get a 20% discount from this, the, the, um, the lawyers that we've got up, uh, on the, su- the supply list. And then we've done the same with training companies. So Cole Cullender, for example, people who train architects, they're offering up to twenty percent discount on all of their courses. Oh, amazing! Um, and then we've got we've got a few other um, providers of um, sort of discounted activities and memberships of different things. And um, mm-hmm. so so there are actually some worthwhile so it's very, benefits. It's, yeah, it's, it's it's a very holistic set of services that Tesla is actually kind of connected to or making accessible as well. It's not just um, in just the kind of recruitment aspect of it. There's the potential for training and. Yeah. I mean, ultimately it could have its own, you know, you're creating a community that Mm -hmm. this whole issue of salaries could, could be addressed there. I mean, it would be lovely, wouldn't it? If, if, if Tesla is used by the employers that do the right thing and, Mm -hmm. um, 
and 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 don't run sweatshops. You know, we want yeah. we want we want to get entirely away from the sweatshop culture of old, and we all know we all know it exists still. And there are some very badly run firms of architects out there um, at where the, the profit margin is is really just made off the mm-hmm. back of the overtime that the young architects, unpaid overtime that architects are putting in, and that that needs to change. And an architecture, although it's you know it's an applied art, it's still architectural practices still have to be run as businesses. And if yeah. they're not run properly as businesses, then you know you shouldn't really shouldn't really be around because the, the practices that are not run as businesses are the ones that can't afford to pay the staff the right level of remuneration and expect the long mm-hmm. hours culture, um, which is which is obviously we all know is play the industry for for decades. Yeah, what well, what role do you think the universities have in recruitment and kind of having students and having young architects? Um, find work and what what role do you think the universities have in terms of the salaries of architects if any is it their responsibility well, i don't think they have any real um direct uh, influence over salaries in that i don't think they're really interested in that i don't think they ever have been but mm-hmm. um there is this perennial debate that the the, the the people that teach at universities teach architecture think architecture should be you know, it should be de- about design and architecture mm-hmm. in the purest sense. And the business side of it is when you get into practice. Now, yep. unfortunately, the reality is that that if we see lots of students come out who who don't know what BIM is, they don't know what mm-hmm. they don't know what um, you know they don't use Revit, for example, which is by far the most um, commonly used uh, or you know CAD software software tool. That, um, that, were, that that is, is used for BIM. Um, I mean, there are others, but but that's by far the most widely used one in the UK. And it, it still surprises me that many schools of architecture are churning out young students who've got no idea that BIM is, is in demand and that's the world they need to be working in and doing 3D class detection. And, you know, they're still working using CAD software, which no, no employer is going to want them to use. How mm-hmm. sad is that? Because then they're just, you know, the, the employers then got to train them for six months at least in how to use the new software that actually the market demands. And then the other one is obviously environmental environmental performance of buildings. Even though we've got climate change, even though we've got all of these sort of, you know, high prices of, of energy now and everything, it still shocks me that we still see a lot of um, architects or uh, architectural um assistance coming out of with a master's um at part two level with very little interest or knowledge about the environment and 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 building performance um which i guess is why the arb is now focused on that the government the government has told the arb to raise the architecture bar in terms of environmental design and fire safety obviously Mm -hmm. and cdm is the other one you know that's the other sort of elephant in the room that most architects have a little interest in. And um, I think, you know, architects need to have an interest in these things. And um, schools of architecture have to take responsibility for lighting the flame of interest and, mm-hmm. you know, leading the way. So it's architecture, of course, design is important, but but there are lots of other aspects of architecture, which is an applied art. It's not just design. Mm-hmm. We have massive responsibilities not least to make sure the buildings perform really well. And, you know, that ultimate, the ultimate thing is, um, you know, construction and property accounts for 40% of all global carbon emissions. So we've actually done the calculation. If you look at the, the embodied, the the carbon uh, emissions of your average UK resident, the person in Britain is, is about 10 tons of CO2 a year. Whereas if you divide the, just the out carbon carbon emissions from the construction industry in the UK and divide that by the number of qualified architects, you come up with something like 1,300 tonnes per architect. So if you do the maths, you can easily see that an architect's a massive gift, a massive wow. opportunity to save hundreds, hundreds of times more carbon than, than a nurse or a GP mm-hmm. or a, a lawyer. You know, we're the people that control the largest single sector bigger than transport 
its construction and properties, the largest, according to the UN, of any, any sector. And we're right in the driving seat. And you've got to ask yourself, well, what are we doing about it? How many architects mm -hmm. are designing Briam outstanding buildings and net zero carbon housing? And the answer is very few still. Mm -hmm. And where's the leadership on that? You know, so well, that it, needs to be a massive it, part of education. Well, it's very interesting as well, you know, in that the universities have a response. Well, I mean, they might not see it like this. And I know when I talk to academics, they'll often challenge the notion of, well, is an architecture degree there to train and prepare someone for the profession? And many academics will say, no, it's not. It's not there. It's it's, it's a, mm. and I, you know, a lot of business owners would, would be like, well, hold on a minute then. And, and the question would be as well, well, what do students expect it's for? Yeah. Is it an intellectual pursuit that they're engaging in? Because they don't necessarily think that. And certainly when we talk about diversity um, and, you know, ethnic minorities and, and people from different backgrounds, they are looking for a, a career and they're looking for a job and they're looking to get paid. And they yeah. want to have, they want to be trained in a way which is most valuable for the marketplace. And it being a purely intellectual pursuit is not, that valuable in the marketplace of, of business and it has all these other other impacts as well like you're saying you know in terms of sustainability and if we've got if we're preparing students and they're coming out and they've got very little knowledge of how buildings are actually put together this becomes a then burden on the architecture practices themselves to have to spend time training investing you know and you know small well, practices we really struggle doing that it does and and you only need to compare our profession with the legal profession or the medical profession mm. you see that those other professions are training um doctors and lawyers to be doctors and lawyers that's what they're training yep. and all of the all of the complexities of that whereas many architecture schools are still up in the clouds and not not addressing some of the really important issues of being an architect that are over and above design i'm not saying design isn't important of course it is it's fundamental sure, sure. but it's both it's not one or the other and you can easily see, I mean, I've been a qualified architect for around 35 years. And in that time, um, I can say that, you know, architects fees, typical fees for the same size job have gone down from 6% down to, you know, two and a half percent, maybe 2%. That's, that's how the fees have collapsed. Mm. The, when I started in architecture, doing some quite big buildings, we didn't have fire consultants. We didn't have cladding consultants we didn't have acoustic consultants we didn't have transport consultants we didn't have access consultants um, we didn't have planning consultants and we didn't have project managers now if you take all of those people out of the equation you you add up their fees probably comes to about three percent and there you go there's your three percent gone that's it project managers companies like mace who are very good at what they do didn't exist uh 35 years 30 years ago they've been going for 30 years and They've grown exponentially. I mean, Mace is a massive company now and um, very successful. And what it does is it's, it's certainly the, it, it's a construction company, but it also has um, a um, consultancy arm that fills in all the gaps. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, our profession has really just de-skilled itself over the last 35, 40 years. We've handed, we've just handed over all of these sort of slightly technical bits that are seen as scary because we're you know the profession's interested in you know design and and arguably the more fluffy bits that that you know and then clients clients are really want to know that you know a job's going to be de delivered on time on budget so they employ project managers to project manage the architect and 30 wait, years wait, ago wait, that wasn't necessary wait, you know it's interesting you look at something like the ARB's code of conduct and some of the things in there for an architect, you know, manage your own, manage your business competently and to make sure that you're looking after the client's budget responsibly. Mm. Um, th these are things that are not even present anywhere in the education in, at, at university. And yeah, it's kind of yeah, I, know, I, mean, I mean, the part three, the part three course that, 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 that some schools of architecture um, have goes some way to trying to address that mm -hmm. but um and 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 you know they would argue that that, that, that some of those things are covered in, in the part three course um but i think the fundamental issue is that that um the entrepreneurial business side 
of of architecture is is really only just touched on skirted over and um it shouldn't be you know we mm-hmm. we need the needs to be far more at a time allocated to the business of architecture but i don't always think it needs to be about you know you, currently the the way the rba education is all and part three training it's all about oh you're going to have your own business you're going to set up on your own build a practice and do this that and the other but it, i don't think that's the way it should be for everybody i think far better to actually join a bigger firm often um wait your turn senior partners end up retiring you know you're you you inherit the business you take it on in one form or other whether that's you know through an employee ownership trust or an llp buyout or you get given shares you know if if you're good then the um existing owners will want to keep you and um you've there are lots of ways of of becoming an owner in an architecture business without having to set it up from scratch which i did of course but i know the pain the pain mm-hmm. of the journey and the first 10 years are really really tough well it's it's again it's very interesting the the you know the kind of impetus on design at university i'd i'd make a correlation that because it's that's a very creative thing and then it provides a lot more independence and then people perhaps falsely think that setting up your own practice is going to be the ticket to being able to realize all of those creative ideas or the individualistic Mm. ideas that were being fostered and nurtured at, at, at university through the kind of culture of very much design focus. And I think that's, that has problems to it because then we get lots of young practices, um, that will, you know, it's, it's hard. It's Mm. really, really difficult. It's really, really difficult. And I think that working in larger practices isn't, um, you know, it, it, it's not what it's it it should be or could be if you like and i think there's a lot more possibilities being in a larger practice and being entrepreneurial if you like and you know how can you can contribute to a large practice through understanding business and finance and all these other competencies and actually there's a whole world of creativity that opens up and actually we get much better businesses as a result and much more ability to impact the built environment Mm. um i I think that's quite interesting i i would you see i think architects undersell themselves and under that because there's a lack of entrepreneurial interest Mm -hmm. um there's so much architects could do in addition to the built environment and also to you know earn earn more earn more rather than being you know settling for with the with the derisory pay that many many are ending up on um, for mm-hmm. example, product design. There's all product design is a, is a really high value area. Architects are constantly designing things like light fittings, doors, windows. You know, I would encourage architects to get into bed with manufacturers. We did mm-hmm. that with a timber frame manufacturer, developed a housing product um, just before the financial crash um, called Optima Homes, and Kingspan bought the whole thing, lock, stock, and barrel, and the IP wow. from us. Um, and I think got orders worth 75 million in the first year of launching that product um, from companies like IKEA, for example. So if you if you use your creative talent and your mm. knowledge of construction and materials, then there are so many areas that that can be applied to generate revenue and opportunities. Um, and then you know, my my business we 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 took the some of the some of the benefit from from having sold the intellectual property in a new housing product and we set up a property company and we've done our own property development um so you know there's all sorts of different things and we designed the building that we occupy now and own it you know there's things that you can do um outside the strict narrow confines of of thinking that this is what a professional architect does um yeah as as the world changes I think we all have to change the way we look at what we do and and um, be much more flexible. Um, but there are opportunities for design um, that can reward architects in all sorts of different ways. Um, I'll give you a good example. I'm, we're doing research at the moment into um, into uh, the next typology of housing for later living. Got some government grant funding for it and some industry backing. And we're looking at the 12 most innovative projects all over the world that have developed, uh, built, 
really exciting homes for later living. And um, I'm going to Australia shortly to visit several buildings there that are really blazing a trail to really kick the tires and found out what is it that's made these buildings so successful, meet the clients, meet the architects, et cetera, and some of the residents. Um, one of the buildings I'm going to see are designed by a firm of architects. And I said, well, but there's a developer behind this. They said, oh, yeah, we set up that development company. I said, oh, how did you do that? They said, oh, we crowdfunded it. We felt that there was such poor quality um, housing for, for older people in this part of Australia. There was nobody doing mm -hmm. anything worth having. So we, we emailed all the firms of architects and said, look, if we each put in X amount of money, should we buy a plot? So they all said, yeah, all right. So we bought a plot and then they designed it. They designed the first building and they're now on about their 10th building and they share the, the work between the, 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 the architects that crowdfunded the property company. They're now getting external funding from banks and they've created this amazing entity and <laughs> the buildings look fantastic. Amazing. But that was because architects took that initiative to say, look, there's a gap here. Well, let's do something about it. And, and let's lead the process. And I think if you look at the, the origins of the word architect, which is obviously ancient Greek, and the word archi is, comes from the, to lead, and um, tech from tecton to build. So you're leading the building process. The clue mm -hmm. is in the name. It's not all about design. It's also about leadership, that, ideas, and, and how you build. That's a really powerful frame like for I mean, you know kind of looking back on the what we were just talking about education and you know that's really what the architect is for is is to lead that construction process to lead the build process and that starts to be a much more encompassing education if you like as opposed to just being yeah and high. i think i think that um for me i find some of the most fascinating people in the in the in the built environment industry are, are engineers structural engineers services engineers, environmental consultants. I mean, they're fascinating, highly intelligent, mm -hmm. remarkable people who contribute so much. And our job is to collaborate with these people and bring all these great ideas together. And, um, and we have got to upskill. You know, architects need to be technically savvy so we can lead. And, and mm -hmm. um, that's the sort of, I think, the change that needs to happen if architects want to be well paid again um that plus you know eradicating these employers who expect large amounts of unpaid overtime and pay to rise really low salaries we've got to somehow you know get these these employers out of the industry one way or another mm -hmm. um and and get architects to, to be on on you know salaries that commensurate with the level of training and responsibility they have what what do you think is the role of say a practice like Cartwright Picard in in empowering architects to take that position again? Do they have? Do, do you see that the industry, the businesses, have an influence on universities, or there is something that in terms of there? the upskilling side of things, the yeah. upskilling bit? I mean, yeah, I've done a bit of teaching myself, um, and I was involved um, with a. Um, part three side of things uh, in the past mm -hmm. I've, I've been a visiting professor at the, the Macintosh School of Architecture for a few years um, and you know you you do your best but even you know I have you do you do come across the seasoned um, academics and sometimes the sort of self-interested tutors in some of these schools of architecture who just just want to freeze you out they don't want to be challenged mm -hmm. and um you know, the the politics that go on in universities and higher education can be quite frightening. Yeah. I'm sure if you, if you um, know anybody that, that teaches right, in the you, university, you'll, they'll be able to tell you. Um, yes, no, I've, I've come across it. And, and yeah. I've also been very interested in the in the general attitude towards yeah. business. I think I think what would be great for the industry would be a few courses um, that specialize in postgraduate ar architecture and entrepreneurism. That's what we need. We could do with a few courses like that that sort of start to encourage people. Um, and it's not about focusing on money. It's about focusing on how best to, in an entrepreneurial way, use your really amazing skills. Because let's face it, architects are some of the nicest people. They are, they've got creativity. They really want to do the right thing. They've got really high 
ethics and you know are, are there the in their heart of hearts they'd love to change the world but how mm -hmm. do you do that and i think that you know we need to help the the young talent of tomorrow to um reach the zenith don't we how how are we going to get all these bright um talented designers to um somehow discover the entrepreneur in themselves and the route and support them um i mean you hear of in, in the in certain certain some of these university the oxbridge for example they've got all these incubator offices around haven't they where you know life sciences um and um technology and uh computer scientists who get degrees there are supported by the university to create new businesses uh and flourish um you know like the likes of um the guy chap who founded um deep mind for example you know which now yeah. now runs now runs the, you know, that, that side of google um you know how to how do we get there's some so many bright talented people in architecture who don't reach don't ever achieve what they could achieve if we could if there could be a better um support network in terms of both education and taking ideas and people like that into doing the right things in an entrepreneurial way to yeah. change the world for the better whether that's about uh, a timber frame housing system a modular steel system or it might be a great way of laying brickwork or a new roof truss system or a new roof light or a window system whatever it is you know there's so much that needs to be rethought re-engineered mm -hmm. um you know the brick is a modular construction system that we've been using for five thousand years the brick and we're still using it you know but so is there are there other things we should be doing yeah there's a lot you know lots and lots of areas that you could architects could have a huge impact on i love it i love i love this uh this this picture of a of a, of a visionary um practical um the, the problem saying solving I like is 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 sometimes the wheel needs to be reinvented that is what you know <laughs> and we all look at established norms and the status quo in our industry and how many of us challenge things that we know are not working right and and the point is we lots of us go oh yeah i wish we could change that but they don't do anything about it and i think this brings us right back to teslate.co we have tried in our own way a co-fund a bunch of architects and engineers to try and challenge the status quo to provide a much more affordable way of 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 matching candidates with employers in good jobs and doing it in a really ethical way and a way that saves everybody money, saves everybody hassle. And what ultimately we need is to get that brand out there and to get people to understand what Tesla8.co is about and give us a chance. Give Tesla8.co a crack, see how it goes, and um, and then give us some feedback so we can continually improve. Love it. Brilliant. Well, I shall put all the details. The it was perfect. Perfect. I'll, I'll put all Don't the details. <laughs> no, I, I'll put all the details of people how of, of how people can sign up to tesla.co into the inf, into in the info of the, of this podcast and um, yeah, perfect place to conclude. I just want to Brilliant. say a massive thank you, James, for that very inspirational um, conversation and the really painting a, a brighter future of the potential of architecture um, and where the and where the future can go. So thank you. Thank you very much. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.